Michael Caine goes up against a British spy ring to find his son's killer in The Whistleblower. And the battle of the fraternities moves to Fort Lauderdale in Revenge of the Nerds 2. It's all coming up next on Siskel and Ebert and the Movies. Teenager Richie Valens, who at age 17, in the months before his death in a plane crash, had three top ten hits. La Bamba was one of those hits, and it's the title of one of the movies we'll be reviewing this week. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. The date was February the 3rd, 1959, the day the music died. Three rock and roll stars were killed in the crash of a small plane that day. Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper. The Buddy Holly story, of course, has already been made into a film, and now here's another movie with the same ending, starring Lou Diamond Phillips and the story of a Mexican-American kid from Los Angeles who became a rock and roll star and a legend all before he was 18 years old. His real name was Valenzuela, and the movie is as much his family story as his own. Here he and his family, his mother and brother, dream of his career. We don't need no band. We just play at bars with uh, the drummer, me, for instance. <laughs> I'm talking about making money! I'm talking about making music. My music, that's all I care about, man. Richie, you know, what you need is exposure. A big place where you can sell a lot of tickets, put a lot of posters up. You gotta think big. You wanna be my manager? Sure, I can do it. That's Eastside Morales, very good as a brother. Valens became an overnight star after he was packaged by a small-time record producer. From now on, it's Richie with a T, R-I-T-C-H-I-E. I got a new last name for you, too. Valens with an S, Richie Valens. How's that grab you? I don't like it. Richie Valens only had three hit records, and Valens. here's his biggest one. <laughs> movie sees that fateful final flight. So, it's between Tommy and you now. I'm going to toss this coin. Whoever wins is going to ride on this plane sleeping in a warm bed tonight. Whoever loses is going to freeze his ass off on the bus, all right? Call it, Richie. Hit! Yes, it is! And so there they go, went to the night, the same ending as the Buddy Holly story. Now, any review of La Bamba is going to compare this movie with the Buddy Holly story. And I'm afraid there's really no comparison because, let's face it, Buddy Holly was a much more important figure in the development of rock and roll. He had a lot more songs. They were better songs. And the movie of his life is a better movie. But La Bamba is a good small movie in its own way. It shows us a kid who never really had the chance to grow up to develop into the big star that he showed promise of becoming. And it spends a lot of time exploring his family life, his uneasy relationship with his half-brother. I like those scenes. I also like the scenes with his Anglo girlfriend and the racism that he experienced in his uh, teenage years. The movie is well-written, well-acted, but the life of Richie Valens was not exactly thrilling movie material. And the fact that we know the movie's ending overshadows everything else. All the same, marginally, I do recommend this movie. And marginally, I recommend it, too, and I have the same reaction, which is that the non-singing portions of the movie are better than, frankly, the, sing the singing portions. He has only three uh, big songs, and that's over fairly quickly. Uh, they save La Bamba for the end. But you, out, coming out of the blue is this very powerful relationship with his brother, well played by Isai mm -hmm. Morales, an interesting relationship with the stage mother who favors the kids of yes, success and right. really dumps on the other brother. Mm -hmm. And those things were good if the movie weren't about a rock star. You know, there was one structural thing that I didn't like about the movie, and that was 
prefiguring his dread that he's going to die in a plane crash. Yes. I mean, this is a cliche that we can go right back to the Eddie Dickens story. He has, dream, story he has dreams. His fears yes. and so forth, where he wakes up in a sweat and this is going to happen and then yeah. it does happen. Even if it's true, Even if it, it's does, true, it it's doesn't cliche. work. You're yeah, right. It doesn't okay. work. But the film still gets, and I, you know what I was thinking? What? You sh uh, have reminded me of a film that people should rent if they haven't rented it, and that is The Buddy Holly Story. It's, if you're going to go see La Bamba, rent The Buddy Holly Story, you'll see an even better film. Okay, our next film is a tricky English spy thriller that is full of more anger than thrills. Anger at the whole covert world of spying, whether practiced by the English, the Russians, or the Americans. Michael Caine, turning in yet another fine performance, he seems to do about three or four every year, plays a former military man, the father of a young intelligent agent in Britain who is tired of eavesdropping on the Russians. He complains it soured him on life. It hurts me, personally. If the Bolshoi comes, if I watch and listen to Romeo and Juliet, I mean, the joy of it is poisoned by the certainty that the KGB man is sitting in the bloody prompt corner. Their secret world has put out the light of the ordinary world. All the more reason to stick at what you're doing. No. But the kid doesn't listen. He innocently gets caught up in an espionage scheme and is killed in what is made to appear to be a suicide. Ultimately, Kane crashes through the layers of British intelligence and confronts the powers that be who shock him by telling him that his kid was used as a pawn. You are telling me that this whole thing was to prevent the Americans, our allies, from finding out that the real traitors were higher placed than Cage or, or Goodber? One of them, certainly. It was the only chance we had to uncover him. Well, have you? Yes. What did you do with him? Left him in place until we can assess the damage he's done, and how most effectively to use him to embarrass the Russians. When you'll do a deal with him so that he can go on drawing his pension and having tea with the Queen. Now, if you're looking for a James Bond thriller, or even something more realistically chilling like the spy who came in from the cold, forget this film. The Whistleblower is not an action picture. It's a picture about character and about anger. And it wants to make just one point, that secret governments aren't good. And if they were, <laughs> they wouldn't have to be secret. The point is made often, sometimes too often for my taste. But the acting by a whole array of fine English character actors is compelling enough for me to give the film a marginal recommendation. I liked it better than you did, and I liked it in the same way that I liked the def In Defense of the Realm, a movie mm -hmm. we looked at a few months ago. Right. These are uh, two movies that represent a whole feeling in Britain right now that the intelligence apparatus ever since World War II has been totally out of control. They've got the, th the third man, and then they right. found the fourth man, uh, the keeper of the Queen's pictures, he was a spy. Uh, and, in the, and, and, the speech, and the intelligence agents are, are being dominated by the Americans, is what this film is. And that's said. another argument, too. Yeah. And in the speech that we just heard there, the whole idea is that these, in order to cover this up, these people are allowed to continue to walk around and have yeah. tea with the Queen, as he says. I think it's a very strong film, and especially strong because it comes out of a father's love for his son more mm -hmm. than his political ideas about the intelligence establishment. A great performance by Michael Caine. Well, he is very good. The only thing that I was saying is that I wish that uh, it just simply been, ha there were fewer speeches about how bad covert operations were and more acting out of that rather than the speeches. But still, I recommend the picture. Okay, when we come back, the latest revenge of the nerds. It's called Nerds in Paradise. Last year we were messed with, yes, but we fought back and we won. We can do it again, guys. The Nerds Part 2, Nerds in Paradise. And all I got to say is I'd like to see a movie about real nerds. I think it might be funny, but unfortunately this movie is not that movie, and the reason is it doesn't have the nerve to really make its heroes into nerds. It's not enough to say you blow your nose on your shirt. You gotta really blow your nose on your shirt, on screen, right there. That makes you a nerd. No amount of talking will get you off the hook there. The real nerds in this movie are the enemies of the nerds, not the nerds themselves, who look real cool here performing their own rap number. There's only one question that I've got for you, and that's who are you? I'm somebody too! And here's another example of how unnerd like these guys are. Would a nerd be able to do this? Listen, butt face, I'm in no mood to deal with an idiot like you. And why don't you just sit down before you really make me mad? Louie? 
Lewis, do you realize you just said butt face to the missing link? Instead of poking fun at the nerds, the movie supplies a fairly racist attack on a bizarre Latino hotel. We have a reservation. We're the Trilands. Oh, yes, here it is. No problem. You follow me. La ta di ta da di da da da. Oh, don't worry. It's just a little evidence. Magic carpet. Now, you just make yourself at home, okay? Ah! I'm just going to go kill your lunch. Yeah, and there you have the knife waving around. We all know that's, you know. Typical. Absolute standard, typical. Yeah, sure. The plot of the movie involves a fraternity convention in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with a nerd fraternity in danger of being thrown out of the Greek organization. I think this movie forgets one basic rule about all movies involving slobs, whether they're nerds or not. If you want to make them funny, they've got to really be slobs, like John Belushi was in Animal House. The trouble with the heroes of Revenge of the Nerds Part 2 is that they're not far out enough. They're not antisocial enough. They're not big enough slobs. They're not messy enough. They're not rude enough. They're not square enough. And all they really have, I mean, apparently their big thing is their plastic pocket protectors. That's that it. makes them a nerd. Yeah, they run that I guess the lot. bottom line is they're not nerds, they're bores. Yeah, uh, this movie is boring. The first one caught us by surprise because not only were they really nerds, and yeah. they were bashful, mm -hmm. twerpy kind of guys. They're more mm -hmm. twerps, yeah. you know. Um, this movie, they're heroes, mm -hmm. and that's wrong casting. There is one nerdy moment that is good, and it's just what you wanted, and proves that if they'd really gone uh, scuzzy, it would have worked. And that's, remember, <laughs> where the guy is getting Karate Kid-like training from, yeah, his, from a Zen master yeah. on how to spit. And that moment cracked me up. I had one big laugh in the movie because he's taught how to spit uh, against a wall, uh, uh -huh. and he kills a fly. I like that. Uh -huh. If it had been all like that, I, of course, have, would be arrested for arrested adolescence, but I would have enjoyed the movie. Okay, well, I'm sure that you could probably get off on parole on that charge. Thank Coming you. up next, Jean de Florette, a battle for lamb between a foxy old man and a gentle hunchback. Favorites this year is Jean de Florette, about treachery in a French farming village between a crafty old bachelor, played by Yves Montand, performing his meanest character in years, and an innocent married man, a hunchback played by Gerard Depardieu, who inherits his mother's farm, which adjoins Montan's property. Montan wants the property, of course, for himself, and he has a plan about blocking up its water supply that he explains to his nephew, his partner, and heir. Écoutez mon plan. Il est déjà aux trois quarts bouché. Et si par accident, il se bouché complètement? Quel genre d'accident? Eh bien, suppose que tu passes près de la source avec un sac de ciment sur le dos. Tu glisses, tu tombes, et paf! Le ciment va tout juste boucher le trou. But even though they do plug up the natural spring with concrete, a good rain and some hard work allows Depardieu and his family to raise some rabbits, lots of rabbits, and later some vegetables, great vegetables. But eventually the rainy season ends and parched earth sets in. And suddenly, Depardieu is begging for rain. At one point, it seems like his prayers have been answered. Oh, oh man, oh, oh, ça y est, j'ai reçu la première goutte. Oh, je vais recevoir en pleine figure cette eau bénite que la Providence nous envoie. Oh, merci, oh, merci. Oh. That's a great scene. Eventually, Montan proposes to lend Depardieu mortgage money, hoping he'll go broke so Montan can take over the farm. Now, this stuff may sound like melodrama, but not the way this film is acted or the way Claude Berry directs it and shoots the French landscape. Jean de Florette is sumptuous to look at. It is high drama, 
that disappoints only when it ends, with the story left a little bit unresolved, telling us part two will be released at the end of this year. Still, on its own, this part of the story is sensational. And it's good because it's so simple. This is not, uh, you call it melodrama, I think it's the opposite of melodrama. I think it's everyday life. People go out there, they try to do something, they're mm -hmm. prevented from doing it, mm -hmm. they work and they strive and their dreams are dashed, mm -hmm. all because of the absolute cruelty and evil of this Montan character who looks so benevolent the whole time that he's mm -hmm. doing it. He, he, he doesn't seem like an evil person, but he is, because to him, the land, and possession of the land is much more important than any city slicker and any city slicker. Well, that's slicker. the other thing that this comes in, brings in, which is the outsider coming in mm -hmm. and how this community, this mm -hmm. rural community, just really clamps down and protects this, uh, itself against this other guy. I wasn't calling it melodrama. I said it might seem like mm -hmm. melodrama, the outline. It is high drama, what I call it. Great drama, and I can't wait to see part well, two. Well, it's a very good film. Coming up next in our video segment this week, two screwball comedies, one from the 40s, one from just last year. And then the Charles, pleased to meet you. Section of our show where we each choose a recently released video that we think you might enjoy renting. My choice this week is a comedy from last year named Something Wild that star Jeff Daniels as a mild-mannered office worker who got taken on the ride of his life by Melanie Griffith as a strange young woman who was a lot more and a lot less than she seemed. They meet outside a restaurant where she doesn't lose any time in trying to walk right into his life. Let me guess. Sometimes you don't pay for your lunch. Or maybe you steal the occasional candy bar or newspaper. You're a closet rebel. Oh, that's my uh, television. I'm going to call the office. Oh. Which way are you going? I'll give you a ride. Before long, he realizes he's being kidnapped and tries to escape, but no such luck as Melanie Griffith ditches her black wig, takes him to her class reunion where he runs into the last guy he wants to meet, a co-worker. Is this the guy who would have wondered what you were using company plastic for yesterday afternoon in that motel in New Jersey? <laughs> Charles, we could have covered that. Just let me know next time, okay? I thought Something Wild was a completely off-the-wall movie, especially later on when they run into her husband, played by Ray Liotta, and the whole caper turns into a lot more than an elaborate practical joke. Something Wild was directed by Jonathan Demme, who made Citizens Band, and Melvin and Howard, and seems to have a real touch for the weirdness right beneath the surface of everyday life. He certainly does. He's one of our finest filmmakers in America. Uh, the thing that surprised me, of course, is that I get taken for a ride as a viewer, just like uh, Jeff Daniels because when it swings into the husband, mm -hmm. this Ray Liotta, in his first major screen role, just takes over the yeah. whole movie yeah. and is brutal, tough, exciting. The movie takes a totally left-hand turn. I loved it. So that from the beginning of the film, you can't really predict you where it's going to go, which is fun. Which right. is, a, <laughs> when does that happen for us? My video pick this week is another great comedy from the master of screwball comedy, writer-director Preston Sturges, who in the 1940s created some of the wildest, most outlandish, downright funny comedies in the history of American cinema. In the just-released The Miracle of Morgan's Creek from 1944, Sturges tells a typically wacky story of a woman played by Betty Hutton going to a farewell dance for G.I.s where she loses her memory, thinks she may have married a departing soldier, later finds out she's pregnant, which she tries to cover up by marrying the one guy who loves her, played by Eddie Bracken. But the possibility of bigamy depresses both Hutton and Bracken to the point that they're talking about jumping into the creek. Maybe we could tie rocks around our necks. Never! What's the matter with gas? What's the matter with bigamy? They eventually attempt marriage anyway in the scene of typically wacky Preston Sturgis dialogue. Now, if the witnesses will let me here. Oh, Miss Sally Blair and my wife will actually like this morning. Miss Gertrude Tucker, Miss Ignatz, Wotoski, Wotoski. Something like that. Or should that be private Ignatz and the rest of us? Are you sure that you love each other? What do you think I came here for? Oh, I know, but I'll be sure. What more do you want? And she wants lots and lots of little babies. You know, for the patter of little footsie footsie. You better lay off, and I won't let you be witness anymore. Now, let's get down to business. Oh, let's. Take off your hat. Ignatz, uh, Rosley, Wosley, do you take this woman, Gertrude Sockenbacher, for your lawful wedded wife, to have and to hold, to cherish and to keep forever till death do you part? I do. Uh, Gertrude uh, Krockendocker, do you take Ignatz, uh, Rosley, Wosley, for your lawful wedded husband, to have and to hold in sickness or in health, to love, cherish, and keep forever till death do you part? I do. Then give me the ring. The jokes fly fast, the misstatements people make are hilarious, and the image of politicians trying to capitalize on the events surrounding the birth of Betty Hutton's children is really the joy of this picture, a very, very funny picture called 
the miracle of Morgan's Creek. Well, I'm a Preston Sturgis fan, but this is far from being my favorite Sturgis movie. The Lady Eve, Palm Beach Story, Sullivan's Travels are all better. This movie, to me, is too long. It takes too long to get to the point. Eddie Bracken stuttering eventually really got on my nerves, and I think that a lot of its appeal at the time was, first of all, the scandal of her pregnancy, and secondly, the obvious connections in the plot with current headlines. I'm not sure that I'd even recommend this one. Oh, I would recommend it. I think the whole business about the politicians trying to capitalize on, I'd be giving away the plot, what happens with her and her children, I think is absolutely hilarious. And I think that the way that these people talk over each other and say things they don't understand, uh, is just pure, natural, fine comedy. It's not as good as Lady Eve no, or Palm no, Beach Story, no, no. but it is far better than most of the comedies I see today. I recommend it. Okay, now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. Two marginal thumbs up for La Bamba, the musical biography of rock star Richie Valens. Two thumbs up for The Whistleblower, the uncommonly subtle, thoughtful espionage thriller starring Michael Caine. Two thumbs down, however, for Revenge of the Nerds 2, Nerds in Paradise, not nearly nerdy enough for us. And we agreed on Jean de Florette, the first part of a French rural epic about greed, evil, and determination. We both admired it very much. Gene thinks it's one of the year's best, so obviously that's one we recommend we strongly, bet. as well as Michael Caine's great performance in The Whistleblower and La Bamba. As a third choice. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of four more summer movies, including Jaws 4, The Revenge. Starring a shark that holds a grudge in summer school, which is about, well, you can guess what it's about. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Raisinets and Goobers are playing everywhere, starring plump, juicy raisins and great golden peanuts. Both now feature creamy Nestle milk chocolate. Bacos adds that delicious bacony crunch to all your salads. Bacos. New Glade 2, the long-lasting air freshener that brings outdoor freshness indoors. New Glade 2, new Soft Sense Body Mousse with Vitamin E, the body moisturizer that absorbs in an instant. Soft Sense Body Mousse with Vitamin E. favorites are here in his greatest adventure yet, Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, rated PG. Starts Friday, July 24th.